The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day, the day that we commemorate as baptism of the Lord and we reaffirm our own baptismal vows. So I invite you at this time to go ahead and push pause and find a bowl that you can put some water in and set it in the middle of your worship space so that when we get to that point near the end of our worship, you may join in with me and with all those who are worshiping with you this day and reaffirm our baptismal vows. Uh, Amy Backstrom, our Director of Family Ministries, has uh, got a few things coming up in this next week and a little bit later in the month. She is uh, planning and accepting donations for a drive-through time where Soup will be given out in toiletries and various other things. There's news about this in our news flash and in our January edition of the Tower Tidings. So I invite you to go on the website uh, if you don't have that uh, copy of those things. Uh, it'll go on the website and read about the details. Also, I think just about every Thursday evening she's doing a, a prayer meeting and the information about that is also in the Tower Tidings. I will share something with you that I don't know that I've shared explicitly in all these many months of recording. But the way our weekly schedule has worked out, we are recording uh, nearly every week on Thursdays. And uh, that's where I am. That's where we all are who are involved in this recording. We're on Thursday. And uh, yesterday, was that uh, deplorable, despicable, uh, sadly unforgettable day uh, it, around the Capitol in Washington, D.C. And the actions and the words that were said, the acts of violence and desecration uh, that were done are still very much in my mind. I don't know what will transpire between this moment and Sunday morning when we may, when we may all be uh, re receiving this worship service. But uh, it has not been easy today to think about the ways of Jesus, to think about baptism, to prepare this service with scenes from yesterday still so vivid in our minds. I do hope that as a nation, in the next few years, we will be able to recover a sense of our democracy, a sense of our interrelatedness, our dependence upon each other. We are not islands standing alone. There needs to be compromise. There needs to be clear thinking. There needs to be a recommitment as a nation to be in existence for the good of the world and not simply the consuming for ourselves. With all of that said, let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning and welcome to worship in this season of Epiphany. Organ music tends to fall into two categories, that before J.S. Bach and that after him. In the category of before, no European composer stands out more than Dietrich Buxtehude, who was born in Denmark and spent most of his working life in Northern Germany. He was much admired uh, among fellow composers and musicians. In fact, J.S. Bach himself, at age 20, walked 250 miles to hear the master play and to study with him for three months. The prelude today is Buxtehude's setting of How Brightly Shines the Morning Star, the chorale for Epiphany. The musical offering today is Peace Like a River, arranged by American Herbert Colvin. The original spiritual uh, was presumably created in the 19th century, although, of course, we don't know the composer or the author or what river he was speaking of. 
But we do know that in Isaiah, the term peace like a river first appears. And in Galatians 5, the subject of the three verses, peace, joy, and love, all appears in Paul's message there. For the postlude today, a fanfare suitable for a festival occasion like Epiphany, a, a fanfare by Joseph C. Bridge, who was a British composer who lived from 1853 to 1929. He was organist of Exeter College and for many years at Chester Cathedral in Great Britain. Thank you. I invite you to join me in our call to worship. 
out of the chill of the morning, we enter the sanctuary of God, where we come for worship and fellowship that warm our souls. We seek to draw near the mystery of God for the nurture of our longing hearts. May the water of life shower us this day and the bread of life renew us for our journeys of faith and service. May God bring justice and mercy and peace through us for all people. Come, let us worship our God who would bring healing and wholeness to all creation. Let us pray. Speak our names again this day, O God, and send us forth as living and refreshing water. Open up our ways to take new journeys, to expand our reach in compassionate service, to grow in wisdom and wonder about our faith anew, to embrace our ever-changing world, which you love so dearly. Amen. Please pray with me our prayer of confession. In the waters of baptism, O God, you have cleansed us and claimed us. Forgive us for resisting your grace and failing to share your love wholeheartedly with others. Too often we follow our own paths and they lead us far from you. Help us to live into our baptisms, to trust that all we need is in you. For you have marked us as your own, loving us without limit. Wash us with your love again, so that with clean hearts we may continue our journeys along the way of Jesus. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. Hear this good news, my friends. God comes searching for us, calling us by name, leading us into the peaceable kingdom. In Christ, we become new people. Lost, we are found. Broken, we are made whole. Forsaken, we are restored to new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please turn to those around you and offer a gesture of peace. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know. I think the sunshine is supposed to come out. It's been so dreary here. Oh, hi, I gotta go. Thanks for calling. Have a great day. Has that ever happened to you? That you get a phone call in the most inopportune times. Or maybe you're at the grocery store and you want this bag of chips and your mom's on the phone and she keeps giving you that finger. We all know the finger. Or, right? We've all been there. We all have had times when we have been interrupted. And sometimes through our lives, I wonder if that is how God feels. Do you ever feel like sometimes you have asked God to please help me, to please protect me, to please make this chaos stop, and he's not answering his phone? Or he's on the phone saying, He's taking care of somebody else. Sometimes I think it's the opposite. Sometimes I think God is calling us and our phones are on vibrate or we've got them tucked away somewhere and we're not hearing it. But God is calling each one of us in the time frame that we need it. 
And so there's all kinds of Bible stories where people didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was God's chosen son. And so people were putting up all these barricades. They were saying, stop, I don't believe you, just a minute. And God kept pushing and Jesus kept doing the favors of the people. And sometimes I think we need to turn our ringers up on God. I think we need to open up our hearts a little bit more and be able to hear the ringer. Be able to take the phone call. Be able to know that Jesus is calling us in perfect timing. So as we're back to school this week or we're gearing up for whatever's to come in the next couple weeks, we know that Jesus is calling us to do some hard things. And don't pick up your phone and say, oh, not today, Jesus. I'm not interested in it today, Jesus. We need to pick up our phones and we need to hear God calling us. Even though sometimes it's hard, we need to listen. Because Jesus is calling all of us in different ways. Nobody is outside of his circle. So I hope the next time your phone rings, probably won't be Jesus on this, but when you feel Jesus calling in your heart, you will be open to what he has to say. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for reaching out to us. Open our ears and our hearts to listen to what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
The gospel lesson for today comes from the opening verses of the gospel according to Mark, and it is Mark's account of the baptism of Jesus, which, of course, is the selected text for this liturgical day of our year that we call Baptism of the Lord Sunday. The Old Testament text that shows up in the lectionary on this Sunday is the opening verses of the book of Genesis, the beginning of the creation story. And I'm going to read that first because I think it provides uh, an appropriate uh, background. It gives us a place in which to set the baptism of Jesus with the Spirit of God brooding over the waters of chaos. So with that said, Genesis chapter 1, beginning with the first verse. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. We turn now to the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, uh, reading the first 13 verses. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were ba baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. I am not sure what I expected to see when I first laid eyes on the Jordan River. But all my childhood imaginings from the Bible stories I had learned were blown away. I was on a Middle East study trip, and we were all at the headwaters of the Jordan River, north of the Sea of Galilee, under the shadows of Mount Hermon. There at Banias Springs, the Jordan River poured over a high, tree-shouted cataract and dropped in a wide, voluminous roar into a roiling pool below. Then it cascaded on its way over river, bo river boulders down toward the Galilean Sea. There would have been no baptismal possibilities here, 
one would have been swept away in the torrent. It was the embodiment of chaos, at once spectacularly beautiful and terrifyingly powerful. Later on in the trip, I would get to see the Jordan River below the Sea of Galilee, a narrow and shallow eddy where Jesus might have been baptized. At the end of its journey, the Jordan River ends in the Dead Sea. Its waters go from the wild chaos at its source to a quiet and very salty end. The opening words of Genesis capture a sense of unease about water. In the beginning, when God created, the earth was a formless void, while the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. In this story, whatever there was before let there be light, the poet named a deep and teeming chaos of waters. And as the creation story continued, this frothing primordial soup brought forth life in all its variety and abundance. But the poet knows that if God does not hold back the waters, then they will overwhelm and destroy the very life God created. The story of Noah and the great flood stands as a graphic reminder. We are dependent upon the breath of God for life and dependent upon God holding back the waters of chaos. Otherwise, life drowns. The ancients knew, and we still know, that life depends on water. Too little, and the crops fail. But too much, and precious life is swept away. These images from Genesis form a backdrop to this story from Mark. As Jesus stepped into the swirling, muddy waters of the Jordan, This ritual act of cleansing turned waters of destruction into waters that signified repentance and sealed forgiveness. Yet the very idea that Jesus, the Christ, would need to be baptized was deeply unsettling for the early church. In the other gospel accounts, The event is shrouded with interpretive gestures. In the Gospel of Matthew, John tries to refuse baptizing Jesus. The Gospel of Luke does not ever say John baptized Jesus. And John's Gospel does not mention baptism at all. The idea of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, wading into the muck with the broken sinful folk of the day to receive the same promise of cleansing and new life just did not make any sense. The Christ was supposed to forgive sins, not have his sins forgiven. The baptism of Jesus upended conventional notions of the sovereignty of God. God was supposed to hold back the waters of chaos, not step into them. The Son of God was supposed to pronounce blessing on the believers, not bow down and be submerged in the rank waters of human existence. And yet, This is the mysterious story of the Incarnation. In some way, the divine steps into the swirling, messy river of life with all the rest of us. God will be Emmanuel, 
God with us in all our messy humanness so that we may be more like true humanity. At that moment in Mark's story, the heavens rip open and the Spirit hovers upon Jesus and the blessing is given. You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. It was a blessing and an awesome gift, the gift of becoming God's Son. And this is the gift that is given to all of us, the gift we accept through our own baptisms. We are, each one of us, sons and daughters of God. Now, accepting that we are God's children does not mean life becomes an easy passage. As Mark's story goes on, the same spirit that hovered over Jesus drove him immediately into the desert where he was confronted by Satan and wild beasts. Mark then tells us that John the baptizer was arrested and eventually killed by Herod. Ultimately, ultimately this spirit would lead Jesus along a path that ends at a cross. Being God's son was no easy matter. It demanded everything from Jesus. As God's sons and daughters gathered today, we must remember this sacred identity and this sacred calling. We belong to God. Thanks be to God. But that means we do not belong to ourselves. We are not our own. We do not finally belong to family, to social group or political party, to nation, or to anything else. All these other commitments are in relation to our primary identity as sons and daughters of God. This, this is the good news of baptism. Yet this is also the challenging news. We belong to God. And so we are called to live as God's children. We do not belong to ourselves. We do not belong to our things and our culture. We belong to God's family. This is the truth of who we are. And we are called to live this truth, even if it puts us in conflict with other identities that would claim us. The great father of the German Reformation, Martin Luther, found himself dangerously at odds with the powers of his day he was also consumed by an overwhelming feeling of personal guilt and anxiety that he would never measure up or be good enough for God despite his faithful life as a monk. <clears throat> These feelings of profound inadequacy nearly paralyzed him. But when the guilt became too great, when the feelings of uncertainty and unworthiness began to consume him, when the waters of doubt were rising and threatening to overtake him, he would put his hand on his head and say, I am baptized. I am baptized. And this would bring him peace. It brought him more than peace. It reminded him of who he was and whose he was. It reminded him that he belonged to God. Not only did this realization bring him great comfort, but it renewed in him the conviction that he must be faithful 
to his course, that he must stand up to the powers of his day, regardless of the consequences. In the story of Martin Luther, we hear both the reassuring blessing of baptism and its clear claim on our lives. Well, for many of us, most of us probably, it is too late to dispute the blessing. We were baptized as infants, claimed as God's children, long before we had any say in the matter or before we knew what was being done to us. We are undeservedly blessed. So, at this point in our lives, we can only choose to be true to our baptisms, true to our blessing, or not. God's Spirit hovers over the face of the waters, waters of chaos and waters of life. In a moment, we will reaffirm our baptismal vows. In this sacramental act, may we remember, may we recover both the joy of baptism's blessing and the responsibility of baptism's calling. Amen. At this time in our worship, I invite you to gather around the bowl of water that you have set in the midst of uh, those who are gathered where you are experiencing this service, joining in this service. And I invite you, I invite all of us together to renew our vows of baptism, to remember that we are baptized and that has consequences for our lives. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we share in the death and resurrection of Christ and are incorporated into Christ's holy church. Baptism proclaims the faith of the church. By the sign of water, God cleanses us from sin, renews life, and prefigures the reconciliation of all things promised in Christ. In baptism, we are given the Holy Spirit as a pledge of this reconciliation. The same Spirit binds us to each other and joins us to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us pray. We thank you, almighty God, for the gift of water. Over water, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through water, you led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt into the land of promise. In water, your son Jesus received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Christ that he might lead us from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We thank you, loving God, for the water of baptism. In it we are buried with Christ in his death. By it we share in the resurrection. Through it we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we receive into this community of faith all of your sons and daughters. Pour out your Holy Spirit once again upon all of us, that we remember that we are made a new creation through these baptismal waters, that we may preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, 
and set at liberty those who are oppressed. To Christ, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Remember, we are baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we are sealed by Holy Spirit, made Christ's own forever. May this be an unending blessing upon your life. Amen. As I prepared for this service of worship, for this Lord's Day, the baptism of the Lord, it began to dawn on me that there is a great juxtaposition this week, given the tremendous violence that we all witnessed at the Capitol building the storming of the Capitol, the violent actions and words, the attack, essentially, on the very foundations of our democracy. The juxtaposition is that comes leading up to the Sunday when we reenact, when we remember not only Jesus' baptism, but for those of us who are baptized, all of our own baptisms. The violence and the chaos of political action this past Wednesday, over against the transformative power of the Holy Spirit present in baptism, that calls us to live our lives in the way of Jesus. Not attacking and degrading and tearing down, but loving and helping and gathering up. So in this year 2021, at the very start of it here, I pray that this juxtaposition will be something that we remember, that we think about, and that we commit ourselves to live in to Holy Spirit's transformative work in our own lives and together as the daughters and sons, the holy family of God. As you leave the sanctuary this day, go knowing that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and forever. That you are loved by a gracious, welcoming God. That we are being empowered by Holy Spirit for faithful witness and loving service every day of our lives. Remembering our baptisms. May God's Hope, peace, joy, and love go with you. Amen.